So let's begin tonight with Ruby Ridge. Ruby Ridge. And this guy, Randy Weaver. Randy Weaver was a former U.S. Army combat engineer and factory worker from uh, Iowa. Now listen, why he moved to northern Idaho during the 80s with his wife, he did it because he wanted to homeschool his children and escape what he and his wife said was a corrupted world. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sounds kind of like me. Oh, does that put me on a list? Does it put you on a list? They ended up purchasing 20 acres of land on Ruby Ridge. Just wanted to get away from everything. And get away from everything they did. It was an extremely remote area in the mountains. The, the only place that uh, they believed it was possible to survive the coming meltdown of the world. Maybe these guys were just ahead of their time. To get to this remote area, this is how little they bothered other people, you had to drive three miles on a dirt road and then another mile or two on an even rougher dirt road. Now, this is where, this is where the propaganda starts and the really kind of bad stuff about Randy. Randy dabbled with some fringe elements, including extreme fringe and dangerous Aryan nation. I have a hard time when you dabble with the Aryan nation. I don't think there is. I think you're kind of all in. It's not like, yeah, kind of like some of their stuff. No. But still, even that's not enough to be arrested. Even that's not enough to have the, the ATF come and kill your family. Unbeknownst to him, the ATF had been investigating that particular group of Aryan nations for years. And during the course of the investigation, an ATF informant met with Weaver several times. Now, why did he go to Iowa, remember, or from Iowa to Idaho? He went there because he didn't trust the government, he thought the world was melting down, and he just wanted to be left alone. So in October of 1989, the ATF informant asked Randy, he thinks he's, you know, another friend, asked Randy to sell him two sawed-off shotguns that he owned. Randy didn't want to at first, but after persistence, he finally relented and sold them to the uh, informant for $300. Now, both the shotguns were illegal. They were sawed off, sawed off, sawed off shorter than the federal limit set by the federal government. They were a quarter of an inch too short. A quarter of an inch. Everything that is about to take place now is because his gun was a quarter of an inch out of regulation. That's it. I want you to remember this as you see all of the new regulations that they're putting in. Do you have everything exactly right? Because all of you're going to see is one quarter inch out of regulation. They use this now and called it an illegal firearms sale, and they used it as leverage. The informant approached Weaver and said, okay, look, I'm an informant, and you're going to go to jail. He threatened him with arrest. He said they're going to confiscate every, every bit of his belongings if he didn't cooperate. The guy stood his ground and said, no, I'm not going to. Remember, why did he go there? He was then charged by the government with selling and possessing and manufacturing illegal firearms, a quarter of an inch. Trumped up charge? Yeah. He was arrested and he was released on bail. Weaver was then sent a letter to appear in court on March 20th. But in that letter, it was a mistake because he wasn't supposed to be there for the hearing on March 20th. The hearing was actually scheduled for March 14th, six days earlier than was sent to Weaver. So when he was a no-show because his letter said something different, an indictment for failure to appear in court was issued. How convenient. Especially how convenient for a guy who already didn't trust the government and just wanted to be left alone. This only amplified the distrust. See, the government is like this. That's when the feds began doing something incredible. They went on his property and they set up an elaborate scheme to apprehend him. They would later admit that they never even considered just knocking on his door because they claimed that he sought to forcibly resist, oppose, impede, interfere with, and intimidate an assault, and otherwise cause a violent confrontation with law enforcement authorities. So they thought the better idea was to place agents all around his property in full camo. They enlisted the closest neighbors to track people that would come on and off the property. 
They had sniper positions scouted. Planes and helicopters were rented for recon. And then they set up on his property hidden cameras in the trees. This remote cabin in the Idaho woods becomes the center of a complex surveillance and apprehension plan dubbed Operation Northern Exposure. During the next five months, the Marshal Service records over 100 hours of surveillance footage from solar-powered cameras strategically planted around the Weaver property. I just want you to listen to these stories today and know that while this guy went to an Aryan nation, and I would never go to one, and I know what they are, does that mean, does that, is it just for Aryan nation? Could it be that somebody infiltrating a tea party wants to set somebody up? And you're not violent at all. You're not a racist. You're nothing. You just want to be left alone. Well, they set up the cameras. Remember, you don't trust the government. But then, because you're kind of a shady guy, um, you sell somebody a gun that was illegal by less than half an inch. And then you come home and you notice in the trees, and this is what the family did, they noticed they were being watched. Now how do you feel about the government? On your land... They decided to hole up. Finally, in August 1992, the operation fell apart. Early 6 a.m., uh, there were a bunch of special ops agents wearing ski masks, full camo, wielding laser-guided M16s. They were doing surveillance near the cabin. When uh, the boys came out with the dog and they, they heard something and they thought, we're going to go out and look because they were hoping that it was some animal that they could shoot and kill because they had run out of meat. The guys in camo were there, not an animal. And they had spooked the family dog. 14-year-old Sam Weaver and Kevin Harris, 23, both armed and anticipating a wild animal, split off from Randy and chased the dog through the woods. And turned and started running back up the hill. And I was yelling all the time. I said, get home, boys. Get home, boys. It's an ambush. The boys don't hear Randy, and they continue chasing the dog through the woods until they come upon the marshals. There, right in front of Sammy Harris, the federal agent shot and killed the dog. Now, put this into perspective. They're on your land. They're in camo. They've got guns. On your land, they just shoot your dog. What do you do? All hell breaks loose. Sammy, 14-year-old, upset, comes out of the woods and fires at the agent, you killed my dog. The agent fires back and hits Sammy. Sammy misses. The agent doesn't. Harris then shot another agent in the chest. Then the other agents begin to open fire. 14-year-old Sammy was dead. One agent was dead. And now the real controversy was about to happen. New rules of engagement were drawn up specifically for Ruby Ridge. The FBI standard deadly force policy allows agents to shoot only as a defensive measure, but the final rules of engagement that are faxed to Washington include the statement, if any adult male is observed with a weapon, deadly force can and should be employed. The guns which the Weavers thought would protect them were now the very things that made them targets. Washington approves the plan, and snipers are immediately dispatched to the hill to create a perimeter around the Weaver cabin. When you hear Washington approve the plan, remember that this first story was done under the George H.W. Bush administration, so it was Republicans that approved the plan. They had a green light. Randy Weaver then went to the guest cabin to view the dead body of his son, Samuel. So he goes here to the cabin. And he goes in, and an agent shoots, uh, the federal agent shoots, uh, shoots him right in the back. Now, can you imagine how much trouble you'd be in if you shot somebody in the back? Shoots him in the back. He starts to run, and as he gets here, the uh, second sniper shot rings out. It misses Randy and hits his wife right in the head. Vicky was holding the door, standing right here, holding the door. The door would have been right here. She's holding it like this with Elisheba. The bullet went through Vicky's head and killed her, and that same bullet went into Kevin's left arm and tore it up real bad, and then it split up. And the main bullet kept going in and lodged about that far from his heart. Some things to consider here. The initial charges against the Weavers, extremely weak. No one ever saw Weaver do any shooting. 
Vicky had no charges against her. Vicky was holding her baby when fatally shot right in the head. The initial shooting was caused because their son was out walking with the dog and federal agents on, on not their property, his property, all dressed in camo, shoot the dog and kill him. And then they shoot Randy in the back. Here's the real story behind this. Eventually, Randy Weaver went to court. He was acquitted on all but two minor charges. Kevin Harris acquitted. All of this started because of a fringe belief. Somebody saying, those people are dangerous. Remember that. Those people are dangerous. In this case, it's the Aryan Nation, and I happen to agree with them. But there wasn't anything else. Except those people are dangerous, and the government infiltration... And then a trumped-up charge, minor, minor weapons charge, quarter of an inch. All there needs, all there needs to be is an excuse. And by the way, the sniper who tried to kill Randy and did kill Vicky, despite them presenting no immediate danger, he was acquitted as well.